I'm thrilled to be here today, and uh, this has just been a fantastic course. Uh, it reminds me of a lot of the acute MI courses that we had in the early 80s. Uh, these are my conflicts. And um, this was the first study that we published uh, a randomized trial of intracoronary streptokinase versus balloon angioplasty, published in the New England Journal in 1985. Okay, so this is really the first uh, prospective randomized trial. And it, back in the 80s, there was an enormous amount of controversy about whether or not thrombolytic therapy was better than angioplasty. And I always went to this one conceptual slide that in order to treat a heart attack, you had to open up the artery. So how is it that when you gave streptokinase with a 33% rate of opening that that was going to be better than angioplasty? But believe me, there were 27 randomized trials because people didn't believe it, okay? And ultimately, the scientific truth won. We figured out a safe, effective way of opening arteries, and that really resulted. So if I ask this panel today, if a patient comes into your ER with three millimeters of ST segment elevation, V1 through V4, what are you going to do? There's going to be complete consensus, okay? Now, at the end, what I'd like you guys to ask is this panel, when you have a patient that comes in with acute myocardiogenic shock, uh, class C, how are you treating them? And I can guarantee you they're going to have five different approaches. And not only the five different approaches, but their partner is going to be different, and the time of day or the, t or the day of the week is going to be different. So that's kind of where we are because... We don't have a consensus, but in 10 years, we will. All right, so there are going to be at least three randomized trials, that are five randomized trials of various forms of mechanical support, either ECMO or Impella, that are going to define the way that we're going to treat them. So really, the, the challenge for all of us is not 10 years from now, but tomorrow when a patient comes in with acute myocardiogenic shock, how are you going to treat them? So we're, we're in, a, in a state of sort of... Uh, equipoise because there isn't one well-defined way of doing it, and, and I'll sort of show you that the way we started. So this, uh, this is our original experience at the University of Michigan with treatment of acute myocardiogenic shock. Uh, a, a, it was a registry compared the outcome between 1983 and 1987 uh, versus prior to that, and we had a 50% survival. So this is the first published uh, uh, trial of angioplasty for acute myocardiogenic shock, 50% survival. And you can see this from the registry data from Europe. Uh, in the blue line are patients without cardiogenic shock. And it's exactly uh, what, what Dave said. We're doing fantastically for treating patients with acute without shock. A single five, two to five percent mortality. But we haven't budged the needle at all for the patients with, with, with acute or myoshock. shock. There still is a, a 50 percent mortality. And the thing that's really important is that there's just an incredible time dependence to survival. So if we're going to move the needle at all in improving the survival for those patients, we have to identify them earlier and treat them earlier. And I think that's really one of the things that all of us, when we're doing our shock programs in our, in our, in our centers, is to really try to identify the, and treat the patients. Now go forward uh, 40 years from, I mean, uh, 30 years from, from the first article we published to the culprit shock trial, 50% mortality. We haven't moved the needle in, in, in four decades. And that's kind of the thing that's really important for us. If we're going to, so you do an angioplasty with a balloon pump and acute my shock, you're going to be right half of the time, all right? You're going to remember that great patient, the, the responder, but we still are still only right half of the time. So if we're going to move the needle, we're going to have to do something different. So I, I, if, if you're going to treat, just like with, a, with opening an artery for acute my, if you're going to treat shock, you have to treat shock. And we have to really start having a, a, a universal hemodynamic d determinant. I, I think the cardiac power output is really a crucial marker that we have to use. Uh, and we know that a, a CPO less than 0.6 is associated with a marked increase in, in mortality. Uh, similarly, we, we know that the perfusion is critical. You have to, you have to get blood to the tissue. And, and lactates are, are critically important. You can see that once the lactate goes greater than uh, two, that you're going to really uh, start increasing the mortality. Now, we've used all of these, and let me just go forward. We've used all of these to now start using mechanical circulatory support. In April of 2016, the FDA approved Impella for use in patients with acute MI shock. And that was critically important because prior to that time, if you wanted to do a study with this device, you had to add an IDE. So now we can actually do a lot of clinical trials, and it's really dramatically increased. Uh, but it was interesting that Impella was improved based on a registry, and there was really no protocol for knowing how to use this device. Uh, but we know that it's in incredibly effective, and this is the data from the first 30 patients that were treated in, in the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative looking at the cardiac power output, and you can see that, that you have dramatic increases. This is not a balloon pump. This is far more superior than a balloon pump. Um, 
We found that the, the determinants of improvement in survival are use of the impella prior to PCI and use of right heart catheterization. And if there's one thing that you want to do with mechanical support is you have to drive the process by using, uh, by using uh, 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 right heart catheterization. Um, going forward, this is our, our protocol. Patients are identified quickly. We do angioplasty, right heart catheterization. If the CPO is greater than 0.6 and the PAPI is greater than 9, we follow the patients. If it's less than 0.6, then we decide whether it's right heart failure or left heart failure. And, and remember, even with anterior MI, 40% of those patients have significant RV dysfunction. So identifying RV dysfunction is crucial, and you can't do this without a, a heart catheterization. So very quickly, in terms of the uptake, we have now over 320 patients. We have 79 sites that are recruiting patients all around the country, including here uh, in, 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 in Texas. Uh, so, so I, uh, Dave Barron, I want to introduce a new shock classification for you. This is, this is class F, okay? The, these patients are dead, all right? So, th so, so this patient, and you see, the, you see the patient has the impella and he had a proximal occlusion of the LAD. Uh, five days, uh, excuse me, seven days later, he walked out of the hospital with an ejection fraction of, of, of 60%. And, 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 and uh, so I think that those patients, really, we have, we have 23 patients uh, that have been 26 patients that have had active CPR at the time of impella placement, and we have a close to 70% survival. So where, where is this ever going to show up in a trial, in a randomized trial? It never is. These patients are dead, and you're resuscitating them. So I think it really kind of shows you that there is a subgroup, and, and these really are critically important because all of us have these patients that we've seen, and the people that have been actively involved with this will, will see these patients that were absolutely dead and were resuscitated and, and left the hospital alive. So there is some value. Uh, lactates are very important in following these patients. We can see the survivors versus non-survivors, and the survivors in blue, lactates wash out very quickly. Within 24 hours, the lactates are normal. If the lactates remain persistently elevated over 12 to 24 hours, those patients are going to do poorly, and you want to think about an escalation strategy. The other final thought that I want to give you is that, uh, that uh, uh, if you could go back one slide, possibly, and I don't think you can. Okay, so the, the one final thought I want to give you is that inotropes are very harmful for these patients, and we found that more inotropes are associated with an increase in mortality for these patients. So these are some of the learnings that we have right now. Uh, the reason that we've done the registry is because we wanted to have best practices. I think we have a very good idea of what best practices are right now for management of patients with, with impella in, a, in cardiogenic shock. We're getting a 75% survival with that, and now that's going to have to be randomized against other medical therapies. Thanks very much. Bill, do you have any sense um, how many patients truly got the device before the intervention and whether or not there's any difference in the outcomes? Yeah, so in the protocol, uh, there, there was protocolized to do it, and it, it increased over time. Uh, currently, 90% of the patients are getting right heart cath, and 90% are getting the impella pre-PCI, but it took a little while for people to sort of buy into it. So for the entire 325 patients, uh, the the total was 73% had the impella pre-PCI. Bill, what about collaterals? You know, what I brought up in the prior discussion. I think that's an important issue. Yeah, we, have an, we, have, we, we don't have an angiographic core lab yet, but I think that's something that we'll have to evaluate. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. When I was preparing my talk for this afternoon, this afternoon, talking about PA catheters, um, you know, I saw your one of your, one of your publications showing yeah. that sites that were the patients who actually received a PA catheter did worse, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on why that could be. From our from our publications? No. Yes, although if I'm mistaken, I'll apologize. No, no, we've never seen that. And 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 if you did see that, then it's probably because there's selection bias where people that are sicker and more confounded, and you're putting in. The device, if they weren't sick enough, then, then they don't use it. But um, the, the one reason why I think there, well, a, a multiple reasons why right heart cath is important, but the number one reason is that 40% of these patients uh, have RV dysfunction. And I think you can really dramatically harm patients with RV dysfunction by increasing alpha agonists and increasing marked increases in pulmonary vascular constriction. So you don't know what you're dealing with and you don't know how to drive it. Uh, the next phase of our investigation is going to be more aggressive use of right heart support or RV support uh, in patients that have RV dysfunction. And I think that's really going to show uh, that we're going to 
continue to augment uh, forward cardiac power with that approach. Bill, did you see any migration in the uh, characteristics of the patients in the shock registry over time? Because it looked like over time the mort uh, mortality was dropping and the results were improving. Was there a shift uh, to less complex cases to account for that, or is that uh, all therapy in your mind? No, I, I, I think that uh, just one quick comment. The American cardiologists are learning how to use this device better. It was FDA approved for shock in 2016. Nobody really knew how to use it, and there wasn't sort of a well-defined protocol. Uh, I think now that we have a, a much better defined protocol, the outcomes are going to improve. Across the country uh, in 2016 uh, for the IQ registry, the, over, the median survival to explant was 51%. And uh, in the most recent data of the IQ registry, the survival now is 62%. So there's actually, across the country, there's been about a 10 percentage point increase in survival uh, with uh, MC with Impella use in cardiogenic shock. And I think it's because we're learning how to use it better. Everybody's been complaining about lack of a randomized trial. We tried to do a randomized trial in 2009. It was called Recover. There were, there were five centers, uh, three years. We recruited three patients because nobody wanted to randomize. And if we would have randomized, it would have been a negative trial because this, the outcome was mar much worse because it was in the early phases. That's why before I agreed to kind of be involved in the randomized trial, I wanted to make sure I had this right. It was just like angioplasty. We had to make sure we had that, that arm correct before we randomized it to something else when you have a new therapy. You guys are doing great work. Uh, congratulations on collecting all that data. Um, Abumet is using you guys as sort of the poster children for, for being proactive and having an algorithm for a treatment of shock. Um, I have two questions for you. One is, how did you pick, I think it was 0.6 for your cardiac power output. It yeah. seems like the curves kind of separate around one. So why don't you intervene a little bit earlier? And the other question is, how good are you at predicting right heart failure? What's your device that you use, and how often do you end up putting biventricular devices when you start with a single pump? So the, the, the first question, the, the, the point 0.6 was the ROC determinant based on the outcome that we've looked at initially in the first 200 patients. So that's kind of where the curve bends. And, and, but the, 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 the better the CPO, the better the survival. There's no question about that. I mean, you can easily arbitrarily use either point 0.6 or point 0.8. Uh, if you end up with a CPO greater than point 0.8, you have a 90% survival. So, that, so that's a very good determinant. Uh, the second is in terms of RV dysfunction. Uh, I think we're under-diagnosing and, and under-treating RV dysfunction right now. I really do. I think that a lot of these patients, 40% of the patients have some uh, element of RV dysfunction. You can do something as simple as a CVP. If the CVP is greater than 15, then they're very likely to have RV failure. Now, the question is going to be recognizing an early therapy. If you recognize it early and treat it early, are you going to improve outcomes? In the Recover Right trial, which is the FDA-approved trial, we found that the patients had a 70% survival if they were treated and recognized early. So I'm hoping that, again, the next phase of our investigation is going to be identify and more rapidly, more aggressively, mechanically support the patients with RV dysfunction. And we'll see if that improves outcome. And that's an Arpella? Is it a protectable? Well, you can, use, you can use either device. I mean, the cardiac assist has a device uh, that is placed in the neck, and you can put in a device. I don't think it really matters. I think whatever your center is used to doing, and whatever you have on the shelf, I think is fine. The, the problem is that when, the, when a patient starts developing RV dysfunction, uh, vasopressor doses start to be increased, and you just worsen the problem, and then you start getting suction alarms on the left side because you're not getting any blood flow through the pulmonary circuit. So I think that's why you have to identify and treat it. Bill, what about coronary perfusion pressure? It seems to me with the hemodynamic monitoring, you could use that and would be a very good predictor also as, uh, as well. Yeah, the mean arterial pressure is the most important determinant. I heard a, I, heard, I saw a slide yesterday from somebody talking about the advantages of balloon pump, and there was a slide where they said coronary blood flow increases by 90%. I want to remind everybody that that's only in an animal model with right. a patent coronary artery. Sure. If you have a stenotic vessel and two-thirds of these patients in shock have severe multivessel stenosis, you don't increase diastolic perfusion. The only way to drive forward flow is by increasing mean arterial pressure. Right. Dr. O'Connor, uh, Dr. O'Neill, uh, so clearly your team has um, led the way with regard to escalation and weaning uh, protocols. 
And we talked about this briefly yesterday. What is your uh, approach to patients that are put on ECMO in terms of venting early versus late, and what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, we don't, we, don't, uh, we, we don't discriminate. We're not actively opposed to using ECMO, but we use it as a second strategy because, remember, I think it, we're talking about acutamized shock, all right? So these patients don't, are not coming in with ARDS with lack of oxygenation. They're having a mechanical problem, either left ventricle or right ventricle or combined. And so we, our philosophy is to try to treat these patients initially with a mechanical approach. But having said that, if we don't have adequate forward cardiac power, we're perfectly willing to put in an ECMO device and use that to vent the ventricle, but aggressively de-escalate the ECMO to try to leave, leave them on ECMO as, as little as possible so they don't have all the inflammatory processes and all the um, uh, hemodynamic processes with the ECMO circuit. Thank you, Bill, uh, congratulations. Oh.